never been this way before since 2015, where we really felt there was a shift happening and that the church was entering into a new era. And the new era signified that what we had done previously um, was great and we thank God for it, but it was almost like we were gonna have to step into a new way of doing things. We didn't quite know what that meant, but we really felt like we were the Israelites on the, jo- on, on the Jordan, beside the Jordan. They weren't quite there yet. So they were beside the Jordan, imagining what the promised land was going to be like, knowing what the wilderness was like. It was great. God, you know, came and dwelt among them with a pillar of fire and the cloud. And then, Feel you know, the one. Hey, the other one. The, the other one. And then, you know, there was manna on the ground and there was water flowing out of uh, rocks. And it was, it was amazing. The wilderness was amazing. God was doing incredible things. You know, they, they complained one day that they didn't have meat and God just blew a flock of quail, went on the ground. I mean, it was like delivery. Quail bodies. It was amazing. For months. Delivery, right? So, um, but they knew that when they got into the, into the promised land, things were gonna be different. They were gonna have to dig their own wells for water. They were gonna have to, you know, have their own animals and whatnot. And, uh, you know, and even attack and defeat some cities. Yeah, the shoes had, they had to start buying shoes. Well, probably not buying shoes. I don't know if there was like a shoe shop. No. But the shoes didn't wear out in the wilderness and then in the promised land, they got to make some new ones. And so that's what we sense. And COVID has really accelerated that in many ways, this whole new way of, of doing things. And so what we've recognised is that we've had to break some of our old thinking in order to embrace something new. And what we're praying for is that you will perhaps by the Holy Spirit speaking to you, realise that maybe there are some paradigms or some mindsets that you're gonna have to break in order to embrace something new. Yeah, I think a key phrase would be that we have to do something new to go somewhere new. And as Pastor Soph said, we're entering yet another new season. It's kind of like the language of our church, we're entering a new season and then we enter another new season because God, is up to something. Come on, people, God is busy. God's doing things in people's lives. He's not leaving us where we were. And although we may have never been this way before, we're excited about what this new season holds for us. Our church is 14 years old. And of course, at the beginning, when we started, we, like any new venture, sat around and talked about what we wanted it to be. Pastors Glyn and Sophia had a church in their hearts that God had put there and they were articulating it. And you can still see those values, those culture points on our website, oracechurch.com forward slash vision and culture, I think it is. And you can see then all of the things, the decisions that we made. But like anything, over time, things change. Over time, things drift. And what we're sort of identifying now on the metaphorical banks of the Jordan of a new season is how we may have um, evolved, um, created over time, some unwritten rules that are holding us back. Right. We didn't write them, that's why we call them unwritten, but they definitely are existing in the life of our church. And I would ask you today to consider whether or not these rules and others like them actually exist in your life, in your heart, in your family, things that are perhaps not from the will of uh, the, the Word of God. They're not what you even set out to do, but it's just become a way of life and you're being held back by, by it, but you didn't even realise. And so we identified last week four unwritten rules that we have seen and identified in Audacious Church and we were trying to help you and us break the rules. Break the rules so we can move forward. Now, if you were here last week, then um, I would say two things. One, get ready for the next four, although the first one is a, is a crossover because it's so important. We'll explain in a moment. Um, but we've got three new ones on top of those as well. But my challenge to you is, have you done yet one of the three steps that we said at the end of the message, which was to identify yourself and so on, and we'll come to it again for this week. But if you weren't here last week, then don't worry. It's not irrelevant or you've not missed it. You can go back and watch it. 
but tune in, get your hearts ready, because we've got four rules that we're deciding as a church we're going to break. That's right. We're going the first one? Number one. Let's go. So the first one is that leadership is not for me. This one we did last week, but we feel it's so important that we're going to repeat it again and just hammer it home. Because um, I was taking you back when we were just starting it as a church, we had 12 of us and it was all hands on deck and uh, we didn't really have this distinction that's kind of grown over the years that being a disciple of Christ is different to being a leader. Now in function, they are different because being a disciple is followership, it's following Jesus and influence is more about, what I say? Leadership. Leadership is more about influence. And so, um, you know, we've kind of, over the years, it's crept into two entities, if you like. But when we were starting our church, we didn't have that luxury of saying, are you a disciple or, you know, and are you a leader? We we just said, look, you know, you're breathing, you love Jesus, we need your help, you know? So we just gave, you know, we just, all hands on deck. It wasn't wasn't a, a, a major issue. But like I said, with the luxury of growth and having lots of people come with lots of different talents and abilities, you know, those things became two entities. And we feel that in order to step forward, we have to break that divide and actually say, if you are a disciple of Christ, you are called to follow Him, but also to influence others. So we're meshing the two things. A disciple is a leader, even if it's just foundational in leading yourself, um, you know, it doesn't matter. So. So moving forward, we're saying leadership is for you. Yeah, we're actually swapping out. You could applaud, it's all right. Good job, Pastor. We're swapping out that rule, leadership is not for me, with a real simple new rule. And as I said repeatedly last week, it's actually not a new rule, it's the original rule that we somehow deviated from, or or perhaps we did, to say that leadership is for me. Uh, This really is a a behind the scenes kind of moment. Yeah, we're lifting the bonnet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, When I was a kid, my dad, if I took something to my dad that was broken, he wouldn't fix it. He would get a manual off the shelf and together we would look up how to fix it. That's right. Pre-YouTube, you had to thumb the pages of a Haynes manual to find out how something worked. But actually, I was richer for it because I learned how to do something so the next time it went wrong, I was able to fix it myself. And we don't want Christians in our church parked up on the hard shoulder of their discipleship journey because they heard a noise or something didn't quite go right or there's smoke coming out of it, metaphorically speaking, uh, and, and we're just at the mercy of just someone else coming along and fixing us and then we're always propelled by an external force instead of being compelled Come on, by the spirit that is in me that's greater than the spirit that's in the world. And so really this conversation is less about us having the answers and just drip feeding you bits. It's saying, look, we're having this conversation. We recognise there's unwritten rules, we're breaking them. And that is the first, and I would say most important one in order to unlock the rest, is that leadership, in other words, responsibility and influence, a key word, is for you. All right, rule number one. Number two is it has to be perfect. It has to be perfect. Now, excellence is one of our core values as a church. It's a goal, but perfection is not. As I said, audaciouschurch.com forward slash vision and culture, you will see our list of cultural values as well as our vision statement, but you will not find on the list perfection because it is a fool's pursuit. Leaders aren't perfect. And in in another rule, I'm gonna uh, sort of dig into that a little bit further. But you need to recognize that especially now, the COVID pandemic has forced us to evaluate and reaffirm and confirm our priorities and that people are the most important thing. People. People come out on top every time. And so as soon as we went into a lockdown, we flooded our church with content. If you were in our church 12, 18 months ago, no, 12 months ago, you will have been like on your phones and computers, you will have been bombarded with content. We did services, we did lockdown university, we did, um, um, oh, I um, remember come on, that. Benny. That was amazing. Yeah, life what hacks. was it? Lock- Something life Lockdown hacks. life hacks? 
It was life hacks and it was awesome. It was and great. so throughout the day, and we had prayer meetings and we had all sorts of stuff that we just got out there as soon as possible. And you could have said, you know what? We could have shot that with a two camera shoot. We could have uh, tweaked the, um, here's my lack of understanding about this process in what I'm about to say, tweak the doobery. <laughs> and made it better. But you know what? We were so convinced that you, the people, that, that the people of God were the most important priority. That's right. We were like, okay, let's just do what we can. And so we shot things on iPhones. We, we were putting things together. And the reason why is not because we, uh, we don't care, but it's because we do care. You see, excellence is a spirit, not a standard. In the pursuit of a standard... In the pursuit of a high standard, you've got, you've got lots of errors potential. You, you could uh, pay a cost that's too high, i.e. the people, or you could you know, simply get lost in translation, as in my standard versus your standard could be totally different. But excellence is something that you know it when you see it. In fact, you know it when you experience it because you as a person come away feeling like a giant. Excellence is, is a spirit not a standard. And you can achieve a high standard with a bad attitude and not really honour God. But when you are excellent, which means giving everything you've got, we actually talked about a key verse from Colossians last week and I'm going to remind you of it because if you want to know what excellence sounds like, if you want to know what excellence feels like, if you want to know if you are being excellent, forget a standard and think about this spirit. It says, do your best, work from the heart for your real master for God. Confident that you'll get paid in full when you come into your inheritance. Keep in mind always that the ultimate master you're serving is Christ. It takes an army of those committed to this pursuit, excellence, for it to become who we are. That's right not willing uh, or, or not thinking that a small group of experts or professionals who perhaps you don't meet the standard or don't have the time for are going to do or achieve everything. It takes an army of people across the whole church. Those watching online, it takes you. Those in the room, it takes you. Those in Chester, it takes you. Those in the future in Sheffield and Cardiff, it takes you. So we need to swap out the rule, Pastor So, from it has to be perfect to it has to be excellent. I would encourage you to take some time to just read a bit and ask God to illuminate to you the difference between the two because we could talk for 25 minutes about that oh, and we yeah. don't have the time. That's so right. I'm going to believe mean, God for you for that. Yeah, and this is what I love. I love that this has happened to us as a church. It's one of the silver linings of not being able to actually gather on a Sunday is that we've had to hit this rule because we didn't have the ability to do what we used to do. And so it meant that we had to rely on people in their homes and with iPhones and just get people connected. And I'm just so grateful because what we're breaking is the, that idea that the few do everything and it's now distributed amongst the church, which is what we're, what we're talking about. It's not perfection, it's excellence. Is that right? That's great. So let's move on to the third rule, which is discipleship is a course. Now, discipleship in our, in our churches often look like a calendar. So right at the beginning of this year, we're gonna be doing this course and then we'll be doing that course and in the summer we'll be running this course and then it'll be going on. And it's, it's more of a calendar, but because of of the lockdown restrictions, we realised that we didn't have that ability to do, well, we had a new opportunity, and that is to put all of our discipleship, everything that we do online, and make it a menu rather than a course. It's not a one size fits all, it's, it's you, whatever you need, you can access directly online. Isn't that right? Yes, ma'am. So, so that's what we're doing. We're, we're, we're removing all of those barriers that we used to have and making it a lot more accessible. I'll tell you what we've been loving as a church is that when we were to put on a course um, in the church building, um, one of our, just one of the things that we just had to accept 
is that if, if we were dealing with a couple, that one of those couples would, would come, one of the pair would come, and the other would stay at home with the children because there was bedtime and there was dinner and there was all those things that needed to happen. So we always knew that we were going to have to have a scenario like that. Well, online, everything accessible. We have now gained both both partners, we've, we've gained um, people who don't have to act, uh, do not have to worry about childcare, don't have to worry about peak hour traffic, don't have to worry about um, dinner, don't worry, have to worry about getting home late or anything like that. But all of that can be accessed within your own home, in your pyjamas if you should choose and the, with the kids and whatnot and all those other things. Um, taken care of. Yeah, so. absolutely. I mean, discipleship, we have always known, but like more than ever now, recognize that it can't just be a course. It can't just be a, se a series of sessions. Even if they are online, there's a, s a degree of discipleship that always takes the form of a relationship. If you think about your life and your discipleship and how you've grown over the years, the highlights or the, the times that you will put your finger on and say, that was a time when I was really growing, I bet you there's a person involved. Because the content of a course may be good and we, we are committed to you enough to make sure that the content is good. And we're constantly working on it and tweaking on it. And um, Josh and Carly were mentioning Extraordinary Home before, which is a course that has sort of evolved over 14 years. And it's like the best thing we can do at the moment. And it will probably get even better. But the key to it and anything else like that is a relationship. We coined that phrase, didn't we, Pastor Self? Life-giving relationships. Do you want to say about that for a sec? What that That's is? Life-giving? Yeah, life-giving so, relationships. So this is um, relationships in our world where that, you know, there is an impartation of faith and encouragement and support. We want everybody in the life of the church to be in relationship with somebody else who is that for them. Support, encouragement, faith in, in, their, in their journey with Jesus. And so as um, Pastor Paul is saying, we are creating and working hard behind the scenes to develop a way that we can make discipleship more accessible than it, even that it is now, but also never forgetting that that only is meaningful because it's done with, within a relationship. Somebody either leading you or encouraging you or you doing the same for somebody else. If, I, if I've got a need in my life and the answer is in a course, then I might miss it because I might not go the reason why is because I might be intimidated, I might be embarrassed, I might be lazy, I might be whatever, in charge of my own life in that sense. Whereas if I've got a friend, someone who is encouraging me and I'm committed to encourage them, as we said before, everybody is a leader, everyone can be a person of influence and I share my need with that friend in the context of a life-giving relationship and they don't have to be an expert, which I'm coming on to in a, in a moment, but when we both hear about this course, that person says to me, hey, you should go on that course. And I go, oh, well, I'm not sure if I'm, and that person says, well, I'll come with you. Or that person says, well, I'll pray before it starts. And when it's finished, call me and I'll see how it went. Can you see the difference? It's not just about the content. It's about the relationship that goes with it because the combo of those things is literally unstoppable. I like that, unstoppable. That's why every week we say, join a small group. It's why every week we say, join a team. It's why we say, get connected. It's why we say, give us your details. Not because we want your information so we can have it displayed and, and marvel at our own data. It's so that we can get you in touch with another person and together you can grow. So discipleship is a way of life. It's really the rule that we want to resonate through your hearts and minds as you're leaving church today that is not a course. I might access it through a course. I might be looking for a course on a specific subject and I've got a need in my life. And, but you know what? It's a way of life. It's a commitment that says, I am a disciple and I will be a disciple of Christ and I will grow. And if we can do that en masse, come on, if we can do that together, then I believe we're gonna... Well, what we said right at the beginning, which is move into all that God's got for us. And if you want that in your family, if you want that in your marriage, if you want that in this church, if you want that in this city, then heaven is waiting for you. Rule number four and the, the last one is leaders 
have all the answers. Leaders have all the answers. When leadership is a small group of people who are professionals doing all the work and taking all the credit, there's two major problems. Number one is that people expect the leaders to sort everything out. That's the danger of that path of thinking that leadership is a small group of professionals. The end of that path is that people just become dependent on the leader making decisions for them and then potentially the leaders become dependent on the nice feeling that that, you know, that, that creates in me that someone needs me. And so we've got neediness begatting neediness, to use an Old Testament word. We've got neediness creating more neediness because I need you to need me, Pastor So, so I feel validated and you need me because I haven't told you how to do what you need to do. That's one problem with leadership being a small group of professionals. The other problem with that is that people don't wanna be leaders because they think, well, I'm not a professional. Yeah. And that's just as bad because then we get this one group of people getting more and more tired and more and more stressed and less attractive to the rest of the church who are saying, well, I would be a leader, but not if, not if that's what you look like at the end of it. Whereas what we're saying is um, a better rule is that leaders know he is the answer. Leaders know he is the answer. Leaders are not the answer. Leaders know he is the answer. You do not have to be an expert in a chosen field to hold someone's hand and walk through that field. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to have all your ducks in a row. You don't have to have your whole world sorted out, but you can encourage somebody else. You can support them, you can lift them up, you can pray for them, you can help them, you can make them feel like they're not alone. That is what a leader does and that's who we are to each other. And so that's why we're saying we need to stop thinking that you need to have everything sorted in order to step up. No, we just need to know who is our help. Our Lord is our help. He gives us the grace. He gives us the ability to do what we have to do, to walk this walk, but also to give strength and courage to somebody else. Yeah, so for the second time, we come to the moment of what now? And really it's about taking responsibility. That's right. We are um, a church of around 5,000 adults. And so if you're waiting for Pastor Glenn or myself or, or Pastor Paul to, to come and ask you um, or, or to try and come to your door, it, it, that is unsustainable. What we need is a new way. And what we really need, just like you would if you were moved to a new city or a new town, that you would go and register for services, that you would go and make yourself known. We are asking everyone in the life of the church, if this is your home, then it means that you are needed here. It means that, that you are a gift from God to us and we really need you to identify yourself. We need to know that you're here. We need to know um, so that we can put you in contact with other people. But we can't do that for you. And that's why we need you to fill in those connection cards that we put out or go to the gazebos and make yourself known. And if you're online, there is a a link in the chat that will take you to um, either our hello page or our life group page, our small group page, our team, if you wanna join a team at some stage, then um, that's how you do it. Yeah, three, three things, oddishchurch.com forward slash hello, where you can literally just kind of send up a flare digitally saying, hey, I'm here, this is me, because we desperately want to know you, we want to uh, care for you, we want to help you grow. Um, you can visit audaciouschurch.com forward slash small groups and there you will find a huge, and it is huge now, a huge menu of small groups that are for lots of different stages of life and different interests and different nights of the week and different times of day because we so desperately want you to, to meet people and grow together and this community to be what it's always meant to be, what we've always dreamt of it being, which is, which is a place that the city knows that's where you need to go if you need something. That's where you need to go when things aren't right. And that's where you need to go if you wanna grow. And of course, audaciouschurch.com forward slash teams that says, you know what, I wanna get involved. I wanna get stuck in. And so make sure you scan the QR code, um, click the link in the chat, visit the website. And if you're in the 
room today here in Manchester. Visit the gazebo straight after the service and the guys will be there ready to meet you. Joshua 24 says this, but if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods of your ancestors serve beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living, but as for me and my household, says Joshua, this is the personification of that moment of logging on to audaciouschurch.com forward slash teams. This is the, the Bible reference for walking across the car park to a gazebo. This is you walking over to someone with a green bag saying, hey, are you new? Because I'd love to, to introduce you to some more people. All that is summed up by this amazing verse that we many of us know and love. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Amen. Amen. I'm going to leave it with um, Paul just now to pray, but I just want to just bring us back to that moment on the banks of the Jordan River. God is on the move. Why? Because He, he wants people to know Him. He wants people to experience forgiveness and salvation and new life in Him. And there are people beyond the river. There are people waiting for you to take your place in all that God is doing within the life of our church. And we will see incredible things to come. Amen.